I'm Taylor. I'm Cass. And welcome to Square Mile of Murder. Hey. Woohoo! You're here. We're here. We're all here. Let's have, all good. Let's have a time. Uh, just a time. Just a well, because it feels like saying let's have a good time when you're talking about murder seems wrong. But also yeah. that is kind of what we're doing here. So Yeah. I mean, you listen to podcasts because you enjoy them, so Yeah. So let's we're, not let's not get bogged down in this again. We've just, just had an yeah, hour long just, discussion. <laughs> we're just gonna float right on by that. Uh because this week we are shining a light on a 120-year-old mystery. Uh, which actually moves us rather nicely from our September theme of unsolved murders into full-on sort of Halloween spooky season. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. The, the sound effects got left in last week. We'll see if they get left in this week. <laughs> I don't remember last week's it was, sound effect. It was similar. I think it was slightly different, like timbre, but, you know, oh. we'll see. We'll see if we can, like, change it every week in October. <laughs> you mean I'm going to have to learn gonna more have to learn to make like, than just a ghost? Yeah, like creaky, creaky door sounds and stuff. I mean, I can bring the Halloween ducks out, and they squeak slightly when you squeeze. <laughs> a mild, a mild spooky squeak. <laughs> so. What was that about sticking to the script this week? It's a, it's a thing. We're going to do it. We said just before we pressed record. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to make a special effort this week. <laughs> we're going to do it. It's going to happen. Starting now. Right now. So. We've been doing unsolved murders. This is unsolved. And it's also fucking weird and creepy and spooky. This is the story of the missing Flannan Isles Lighthouse Keepers. Shine a light. Nice. Yes. Yes. I was very proud when I wrote that joke. <laughs> yes. It's good. It's good. So yeah, this mystery has been debated for over a century, but nobody has been able to prove one way or another what happened, and many, many theories have been posited, including murder, abduction, natural disaster, my personal favorite, aliens, and or supernatural beings. Which are my personal favorite. Well, so... Everyone's got a favorite. You mm -hmm. all can pick yours at the end of the episode. Uh, so let's go back to Victorian Scotland and see if we can work out what happened. The Flannan Isles are a group of tiny islands in the Outer Hebrides off the northwest coast of Scotland. So these, these islands are also known as the Seven Hunters, which I think means there's seven of them. I couldn't find a definitive list. I mean, uh, it would make sense. Uh, the nearest place with permanent residence is the Isle of Lewis and Harris, which is about 20 miles east, which is one island <laughs> and not two. I always thought there was the Isle of Lewis and the Isle of Harris. I did too. Yeah. And I learned doing the research for this that it's one island. There's just mountains in the middle or big hills mm -hmm. that separate Lewis from Harris, but it's one landmass. Interesting. Yeah. There you go. And if my map reading is correct, the Flannan Isles are one of the most remote island groups in the Hebrides. The St. Kilda Islands are further west, but I believe that's it. Mm. Now remember that because it will become important later. <laughs> uh, according to BuzzFeed Unsolved, because I couldn't find a primary source for this, these islands were known for having a positive effect on sheep. And historically, over the centuries, um, if, you know, if sheep were ill, grazing on the islands would help them and they were more likely to have twins, twin lambs, if they grazed on the islands. And so as a result, shepherds would just take their flocks over to the islands to graze, then take them back again to wherever they came from. <laughs> uh, as a result, uh, there was like a few bothies, which are like, think of them as like, I don't know what the technical definition is, but I always think of them as they're like little huts yeah. out in the wilderness in Scotland. And they're kind of like, if you're out hiking, it's a place you can stop overnight. Yeah, kind of. I'd call them like 
camping isn't the right word, but like camping shelters or yeah or in the united states in some like national parks you get like ranger stations that a structure that you can shelter from the elements in i mean across scotland there's like hundreds of them in various states of (laughs) repair and disrepair so some are like perfectly fine you can stay in them and some of them are just ruins yeah so there's a few bothies across these islands and a chapel and for centuries, there were no permanent residents. Still aren't permanent residents. Just uh, magic grass for sheep. Yeah. The twins thing is really interesting. I wonder if it's yeah. something in the vegetation. Maybe. I mean, there's so much mythology and folklore yeah. surrounding twins, though, isn't there? And multiple births. So. Yes. I thought you were going to say surrounding Scotland. Oh, yeah. Also that. (laughs) We'll get to that soon. Well, (laughs) later. Because of its position uh, as some of the first land masses that you come across between Canada and Scotland, uh, and they are very rocky land masses at that, um, in the 1890s, it was decided that a lighthouse would be built on the Eileen Moor, the largest Flannan Isle. Construction began in 1895 and was completed in 1899. Uh, The lamp was first lit in December 1899, and from then onwards, the lighthouse was manned by a team of four men. Uh, Three men were on the island at all times. They worked six weeks on the island, followed by two weeks off, uh, and that was worked out so that there would always be three offshore and one onshore at all times. Yeah, I've just realized the way I've worded that. So offshore, I mean on the island, yes. so off the mainland, and one onshore as in back on the mainland. Yeah, I got confused when I was reading that last night, and I was like, offshore means on island. Yeah. <laughs> well, so basically, three were always on the island, uh, and one was not Yeah, but that's the way I understood it anyway, because it sounds like, you know, every two weeks one would leave and be replaced. Yeah, which which is a good way to do it, you know? Yeah. So in mid-December 1900, the lighthouse was being maintained by principal keeper James Ducott, who was 43, Thomas Marshall, who was 40, and Donald MacArthur, who was 28. And the fourth man, Joseph Moore, was... uh, Possibly on the mainland or just not on the island. Yeah. Uh, He was on his two-week leave. Yeah, he was was on vacation. He was napping. (laughs) Um, Donald MacArthur was an occasional keeper. He didn't usually work on Eileen Moore. He was filling in for regular keeper William Ross, who was uh, out on sick leave. In some sources, Donald is referred to as William or Donald William, but uh, we will stick with Donald to <laughs> avoid potential confusion. By which we mean our own confusion. Yes. Generally, if ever we're sticking to one or another version of events or names or pronunciations, it's mostly for our benefit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we can keep if, things straight. Yeah. To avoid confusion just means so we don't confuse ourselves and each other. Yeah, exactly. Because that is... We're very easily confused at times. <laughs> so easy to do. As is evidenced by the onshore-offshore discussion we just had. So, um, yeah. So his name is Donald. Deal with it, basically. Uh, on December 15th, a steamer, the Arctor, was traveling from Philadelphia to Leith near Edinburgh. And the crew noted that the lamp was not lit. Uh, Luckily, the conditions were clear enough that the ship could sail around the islands without, you know, crashing into said islands. Lucky for them. Uh, But they couldn't report that the lighthouse wasn't, you know, on until they arrived at Leith a few days later on December 18th. Crew of the actor reported that the Eileen Moore lighthouse lamp wasn't lit to the Northern Lighthouse Board. So the Northern Lighthouse Board is the General Lighthouse Authority for Scotland and the Isle of Man. 
which I found quite interesting. It's interesting. Because, well, the Isle of Man is sort of its own entity. Yeah. Uh, the relief boat for the lighthouse, which would ferry the crew to and from the mainland or the nearby islands to the Flannel Isles. I can't say it. Flannan Isles. Flannan, yeah. I was like, wait, that sounds I want different. I to say Flannel Isles. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so nice and cozy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, it was called the Hesperus. So it was due to leave uh, the Isle of Lewis and Harris on December 20th. But because of the bad weather, the Hesperus didn't reach Eileen Moor until Boxing Day, which is December 26th. So relief, lighthouse keeper Joseph Moore was on board the Hesperus, but the boat wasn't able to dock because of the weather. So Moore had to row ashore in the tender. Uh, the captain of the Hesperus tried to make contact with the keepers by blowing the ship's horn, but nobody responded. And Nobody made their way down to the dock to welcome Moore ashore, as they would usually do. And they also noticed that the flagpole, which would usually usually fly the saltire, which is a, the Scottish flag, um, just wasn't there. Uh-oh. Flagpole, well, the flagpole was there, but the saltire wasn't. No flag. Wasn't. No. No flag. Uh, once on the island, Moore made his way up to the lighthouse. The gate and front door were shut, but inside was deserted, and he noticed that the clocks had stopped, which meant it was a few days or possibly even a week had passed since anyone had wound them on to keep them from stopping. Back in the days before you had to keep buying batteries for your watches and clocks. Yeah, right. Had to go. The only sign of life was the crew's canary, who, unfortunately, at that point was... Uh, half starved because you know hadn't eaten in a bit and unfortunately we do not know the fate of the canary so no the canary is only mentioned in passing so hopefully was fine yeah but a good indicator that nobody had been there to feed it yeah. for a few days more returned to the Hesperus for help, and two others returned to the island with him to look for the three missing lighthouse keepers. As the three men searched the lighthouse in the island, they found no signs of the three keepers. They did, however, find one set of waterproof overalls, which suggests that one of the men had left the lighthouse without the appropriate clothing. Other than that, nothing was out of the ordinary. The living quarters were fairly neat and tidy. The beds had been made like they would be every morning and nothing was missing. Uh, although a box that was supposed to be tied up along the railings on the path up from the west dock was open and the contents uh, had been scattered around or blown away. So it seemed that something had broken the rope tying the box to the railings. Moore also checked on the lamp and it was in perfect working order. Again, just not lit. Uh, the captain of the Hesperus sent a telegram to the Northern Lighthouse Board explaining that the three men had disappeared and that the clocks were stopped, estimating that it had happened at least a week earlier. The captain believed that the men had fallen from the cliffs to their deaths during a storm. There was nothing pointing directly to that uh, assumption, but there was no other explanation for the disappearances, and a storm would also explain why the box had come loose. On December 29th, Superintendent Robert Muirhead from the Northern Lighthouse Board arrived on Eileen Moore to begin his investigation. Now, we're not sure if Joseph Moore or any other keepers stayed on the island during this time to tend the lamp, or if it was unoccupied until the investigation was complete. Not really specified. Uh, according to the Northern Lighthouse Board, Superintendent Muirhead knew each of the missing keepers and had personally recruited each of them. Uh, Muirhead's report concluded that two of the keepers had left the lighthouse and gone to the western dock in the bad weather to secure something, and then the overcoat left behind meant that the third keeper had then left the lighthouse to join them, possibly assist them in, you know, in a rush, mm -hmm. which is why he wasn't properly dressed. It was also noted that the third man abandoning his post and the lighthouse itself was a breach of duties. He should have just remained there and ignored his colleagues in trouble. 
I mean, like, yes, but also no. Yeah, like, I understand why. Yeah. But also, what human being is going to do that? Yeah, exactly. And also, like, that's a hard thing to remember to do in the heat of the moment of, like, panic and, like, oh, that's, you know, that's my friend down there getting eaten by the waves or whatever. Yeah. Um, Muirhead, uh, Muirhead concluded that the three men had been swept away by a huge wave during the storms, which, uh, owing to the damage done to the West, the West Dock, which was described as difficult to believe unless actually seen. Yikes. So, it was a bad storm. Yeah. And uh, Wikipedia very helpfully notes that it is not known whether or not this explanation gave any comfort to the Keeper's families. Like, thanks. Thanks, Wikipedia. Yeah. Just like... They were swept out to shore and probably suffered and then drowned. Just like, it probably didn't offer much comfort. <laughs> yeah. It's a rough storm and it's cold. It's just none of it is comforting. Well, that's the thing. It's December in, like, really high North Atlantic. And, like, so it's going to be fucking frigid. It's going to be, like, Titanic, the night the Titanic sank levels of cold up there. Probably even colder. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> yikes. The second they're in that water, they're fucked. <laughs> so after the investigation, the lighthouse on Eileen Moore was restaffed and continued to be operated in the same fashion until 1971, when it was fully automated um, and it's now controlled from the nearby Isle of Lewis and Harris. The bodies of the three keepers have never been found, although given the official explanation that the three men were swept out to sea, it was unlikely that they were going to be found. Uh, this, of course, has spawned many theories and alternative explanations of what happened to the three lighthouse keepers. Uh, and, of course, we are going to look at some of them. Uh, one of the more realistic theories is that one of the keepers suffered a psychological breakdown, which led him to kill the other two and then himself. Now, this theory has become quite popular, and that is due to it being actually kind of based in fact. Uh, while on the island, part of the keeper's job was to keep logs and records, of what happened on the island, uh, the weather, passing ships, anything out of the ordinary that happened, including the mood or actions of the crew members. Because of these logs, we know that on December 12th, Thomas Marshall recorded in the logs that they were experiencing a most terrible storm and that principal keeper James Ducat had seemed very low and he had even seen the relief keeper, Donald MacArthur, crying. There were no logs for four days, but on December 17th, the last log was written. It said, Storm ended, sea is calm, God is over all. After this, there were no more logs, and it's believed that it was around this date that the keepers vanished. As it was the next day that the Arctar passed the islands and noted the lamp was not lit. What's strange, though, is that there was no storm recorded in the area between December 12th and December 17th. If the mood on the island was low, it is entirely possible that one of the men could have suffered some kind of breakdown. It is even possible that the three men could have suffered from, like, a shared delusion, like a philia toi. Yeah. <laughs> which has been known, yeah. like, entire families have been known to suffer. From like a folia dirt. Yeah. Especially since the log shows they believed there to be a storm on the island when there's no like meteorological records showing a storm on those dates. Um and one thing I just thought of when I say just thought of, it's because it was mentioned in one of the films made about this story, which is not it's very loosely based, but they mention Quicksilver, mm. which is Mercury. Mm -hmm. Mercury can send you insane. Yeah. And Mercury was possibly still is used in these old lighthouses. 
And if you got to do repairs on anything, you would often need to use mercury. Uh huh. Like the like the phrase the Mad Hatter comes because mercury was used in millinery. Yes. In making hats, and it drove people insane. So a kind of psychological breakdown of some description could have been caused if they'd come into like a lot of con or like prolonged contact with the mercury. Mm-hmm. Um, another explanation is that in the days with no logs, one of the keepers killed the other two in kind of maybe like a fugue state. Yeah, the lights out here sometimes just turn off and then right back on, and it's terrifying. Yeah, especially since it happened when I said the word fugue, fugue state. state. Oh, it didn't happen again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they could have been in like some kind of like fugue state or just have no idea, you know, have complete break with reality. Yeah. Killed the other two keepers and when they came out of it, recorded, you know, in the logs that the storm had passed, everything was fine. And then at some point gone on to take their own life. Of course, the first problem with this is that it's all circumstantial. Based on very vague keepers logs. And secondly, as with the original official explanation there's no bodies yeah but even if like the bodies washed up the damage from them being battered on the rocks could even be consistent with like blunt force trauma mm-hmm. in like like homicidal blunt force trauma so even if the bodies did get washed up there's no guarantee that you'd be able to figure out cause of death anyway yeah and it it would be plausible that one of the keepers could have killed the other two and thrown their bodies into the sea but then what happened to the third body? Could have thrown himself into the sea from the cliffs above, which in parts there were two, 200 feet above sea level. And, you know, then being washed out to sea from there. But it was not beyond the realm of possibility. If you're on an island for six weeks, there's just two other people. Away from your family, your loved ones, the weather's bad, the days are short, it's cold, there's no electric, there's no communication from the outside world. Even the most sane and stable person could struggle in that environment. Yeah, absolutely. It's very isolated. Yeah. See, I think I'd thrive in that environment (laughs) if I had the internet. (laughs) Yeah, it's like... Like, there's nobody around, just me and the seabirds. Tend in my little lighthouse. I'd be fine as long as I had the internet. There's like, I remember seeing, oh, I think it was actually someplace that my mother visited. There's like a a lighthouse in like Michigan or something that you can stay in as a vacation rental, which is like nice. so cool. Also, I have a theory. What if the storm in the log did not refer to an actual storm, but some sort of, like, mental upheaval. Like, oh, Mm. well, now the storm has passed. Like, Donald's not crazy anymore, basically. Yeah. That's that's my only theory. (laughs) Well, when you think about that time period, like, mental health was not spoken about. Yeah. It wasn't talked about in any real proper way. Yeah. So it could have been a way of talking about mental health without talking about it. Yeah, it could have been sort of like euphemistic, especially if like whoever wrote the log, like, I don't know, that was some sort of shorthand that they had come up with or something. I don't know. Yeah, and it's a very, mas- I was going to say masculine, it's very male-dominated industry, anything to do with the sea, especially at this time. Yeah. So you wouldn't talk about emotions and mental health and things like that. Even now, you'd struggle to get, you know, those blokes who like are out on trawlers for weeks <laughs> on end or who work on the rigs for, for, you know, a couple of months at a time. Yeah, no. So that's my theory. You know. Yeah, let, I, I like let it. Us, let us know how I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. that. Like, literally, that's just the first thing that struck me uh, based on the log entries like especially because it's just kind of like it's very short and the thing about god is over all or whatever like Mm. i'm sure that it's over all is in like two words as in over 
all of us. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But just like, I don't know. I don't know why I'm slow explaining it to you because you can see the script. <laughs> Look, we've learned that even because, even though I can see the script, doesn't mean that I understand <laughs> or can read the script. So you're not <laughs> wrong to explain something. <laughs> Oh, Christ. Um, but yeah, anyway. So, on to our next theory, which still lands in both sort of reality and true crime. And that's the idea that the keepers may have been murdered by someone who came onto the island uh, or possibly abducted them. Um, and uh beings that came onto the island were human that's this theory yeah human murderers and or kidnappers basically yes yeah, so still, still firmly in the land of reality yeah. uh so again much like the previous story that one of the men killed the other three this theory uh is almost entirely circumstantial based on the fact that no b bodies have ever been recovered uh however it could ex the strange logs if someone were to murder or kidnap the keepers they could have forged the logs so that when someone did discover the island abandoned they would have blamed it on the storm or the keepers state of mind now around about now you might be thinking surely even back in 1900 there must have been some kind of protocol or plan for checking up on the keepers and some way of checking that everything is okay and there was, in theory. So because there was no radio contact between uh, Eileen Moore and the mainland or uh, one of the nearby inhabited islands, the Northern Lighthouse Board appointed a gamekeeper, Roderick McKenzie, from nearby, nearby Isle of Lewis and Harris to check nightly that the lighthouse was lit. He was paid eight pounds per year which today would be about a thousand pounds per year, just to check each night that the lighthouse lamp was lit. Uh, Mackenzie was supposed to report to the Northern Lighthouse Board if the lamp wasn't lit. And the keepers also had a way to communicate with Mackenzie if they needed help. They would hang metal discs or balls from a pole on the balcony at the top of the lighthouse so that they would swing and block the light indicating that something was wrong. Clever system. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like smoke signals almost, yeah. isn't it? Just uh, For the equivalent of a grand a year, this isn't a bad gig. You look, make sure the lamp is on, if it isn't, or something swinging and blocking the light, you radio or telegram the lighthouse board and they investigate. Yeah. That's it. It's five minutes a day and you get a thousand pound a year. I I want that job. Yeah. That now talk about like passive income side hustles for for your mm -hmm. modern age. This is yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. I am working out where my nearest lighthouse is that's still operational <laughs> and I don't know where they're at. There's two. I think they're both there's two in town. They're both great like they're both protected or listed. Uh -huh. They have some kind of protection status. Um but I don't think they're actually lit. No. So now I just need to find, like, a, a manual controlled lighthouse. I need to move nearby and earn a thousand pound a year just, just looking, by looking at, at it. it. Yeah. Like you say, great side yeah. hustle. Because if he was a gamekeeper on an estate on Lewis and Harris... Is that he'd have his lodgings paid for? Yeah, he'd have an income. Yeah, you know he's he's doing pretty well. Yeah, and got his side hustle going. So. Sounds great. It turned out that Mackenzie, whilst taking note of whether the lamp was lit or not each night, didn't do the second half <laughs> of his job, which was to report any outages or anything unusual or you know swinging discs. Mackenzie, you literally had one job. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Dude. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't until Superintendent Muirhead questioned Mackenzie as part of his investigation, which is in early January 2000, uh, 2001, 
Yeah, it took a hundred years to investigate. It was a really long, hard investigation, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, as part of his investigation in early January 1901, uh, that Mackenzie told him he hadn't seen the lighthouse lamp lit for most of December. Oh, good. If the weather's particularly bad, like the fog is really thick, yeah. you might struggle. But like... I wonder if he had to like monitor the foghorn as well. <laughs> I wonder if it could be heard from 20 miles away. Don't know. Clearly wasn't good at what he was supposed to do, so... No! I hope they didn't add more uh, responsibilities. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he got sacked. Yeah, really. I hope they found someone else on the island. Like, literally anybody else, a child could do this, and quite happily, too, I'd imagine. Yeah. Imagine all that, like, a thousand pound pocket money a year for looking for a lamp. Great. Start start your college fund. Uh, between December 7th and 26th, Mackenzie only saw the lamp lit once, which was the 12th of December. And then Moore relit the lamp on the 26th when he arrived uh, on the Hesperus and found the island abandoned. But it's interesting that, because we're thinking... Everyone sort of think it's around like the seventeenth, eighteenth. Yeah. That they go missing because of the logs, the the Arctar steamer yeah. going past. But there's been a period of time before that. When it also wasn't when lit. there was no Yeah. So interesting. Uh had Mackenzie contacted the Northern Lighthouse Board, would they have been able to do anything to find or save the keepers? We'll never know. They might have been able to find the bodies, you know, if they had been swept off. If they got there within like a day or two, mm -hmm. possibly, before they got swept right out into the Atlantic. But this is, of course, very speculative. Yeah, that is, that's a big, I'm sorry, but most of December is a big chunk mm. of time. <laughs> yeah. Kind of an issue. Um, And apparently earlier in the year... Um, James Ducat, who is the principal keeper, mm -hmm. had spoke to the Northern Lighthouse Board and requested that they experiment how long it would take someone to actually notice and report back. Mm. Like, so they basically just went, they were like, right, we're not going to light the lamp today mm -hmm. and see how long it took. But that experiment was never done. Maybe it should have been. Yeah. And then they would have known if they had the right person for the job. Yeah, I think uh, that maybe should have should have done that with old old Mackenzie mm. there. Yeah, you know, kind of like a probationary period yeah. in a new job. Yeah, it's like first three months we can fire you if you really suck, kind of thing. <laughs> so, as we said before, over the past one hundred and twenty years, there have been many theories as to what happened to the keepers. And while being swept out to sea, one of them murdering the others and then taking his own life, or someone coming onto the island to murder or kidnap them are the most realistic explanations. That, of course, hasn't stopped people from coming to more far-fetched, otherworldly conclusions. Of course, because that's what we do. Uh, so... Some people have claimed that aliens took the keepers. I like it. Uh, I knew you would like yeah. that. I, look, I love an alien. You gotta, yeah. you gotta love them, right? Um, mm. Do you still believe the, the aliens and the Dyatlov Pass? I still believe that the aliens and the Yetis had a big party, the music was too loud, it caused an avalanche, and that's what happened. End of story. And if you have no idea what we're on about, Patreon. Come join Patreon <laughs> and vote in my poll because the none of the patrons voted, and I feel sad about it. <laughs> my mother didn't even vote. Very disappointing. Anyway, just go cry in the corner after this. Yeah, that is to say, we did a bonus episode on Dyatlov, and Yetis and, and aliens were involved. If you can believe. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, maybe aliens took them. Others claim it was creatures of the sea 
who spirited them away to another realm. I like that one. I like mm-hmm. that one a lot. I like this one. Uh, now, Scotland, like most places, is rich in folklore, and according to the folklore of the Highlands and Islands, in seas surrounding the outer Heb- Hebridean Islands lurk the blue men of the Minch. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Brilliant name. Yeah, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it's very much does what it says on the tip. Yeah. Blue men of the Minch. <laughs> So the Minch is a strait of water which separates the Northwest Highlands from the Outer Hebrides, and the Little Minch separates the Inner and Outer Hebrides. There's, if you go on the Wikipedia page for the Minch, or the Blue Men of the Minch, you can find a map that shows where the Minch and the Little Minch are. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Because I don't think I've explained it very well there. I mean, it kind of makes sense. But, like, also, if you're not well acquainted with the... Islands, the hep- geography, yeah, the highlands and it, islands. It means yeah. very little. <laughs> I mean, it makes it makes sense to us because we know what like, we know what the. So if you don't know, the Hebrides are islands in Scotland. Yes, I don't think we actually. I think we did that. say it, but it was just like one sentence. So yeah, islands. So yeah, you have inner and outer. <laughs> That's why lighthouses, <laughs> islands. <laughs> there is a map that shows where the minch is we'll is... we'll link to that in the show notes for yeah. sure yeah. um yes yeah, so so that's that's the minch and the blue men supposedly look the same as humans except they have blue skin kid i mean yeah it's just just what it sounds like um there's also the variations where they're basically where they're basically blue. <laughs> basically, they are blue mermen. I wondered. Yeah, this sounds like a merman kind of thing. So, either or probably just depends who's telling the story, yeah. really. But the top half is human and blue, and, and blue. blue. That's all you need to know. The, the bottom half is open to discussion. And but it's in the water. Like it doesn't matter. Probably. <laughs> so it's fine. Don't worry about it, guys. Um, and along with being blue, uh, they have the power to create storms. And when the weather is calm, they lurk on or just below the surface of the water for unsuspecting passing ships and also sleep in underwater caves. I like that. Yeah, it sounds cozy. It sounds. Have you because seen Luca yet? The new? I have not. Oh, okay. It sounds a lot like that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so go watch that <laughs> uh, when the blue men of the minch find a ship some say they call to it in a, you know, similar to the traditional you know, sirens mm-hmm. who lured sailors to their deaths others say they stalk the vessel either way they will eventually rise up and their chief challenges the boat's captain to a poetry duel <laughs> Uh, the chief will say two lines of poetry, and the captain has to reply with two rhyming lines, and so on. If the captain comes up with lines, you know, no problem, the blue men are defeated, and they will return to their caves. And just go back to the water, let the ship pass. But if the captain struggles, then the blue men will wreck the ship and drag the crew to their watery deaths. Uh, look. That's not fair, because they're boat captains. They're not poets. Yeah, but think of like sea shanties and things like that. There is a rich <sighs> history. Yeah, that's true. Of, of songs and poetry and things on the ships. That's true, but like at least then all Scottish crews should like have a bard or some like specific position for some sort of like poet or writer or like singer cantor or something you mean like and then when they can take on the challenge you mean like when the armed forces send a war artist out to the front line instead of people who should be there or like they should do a bugle player we'll take a poet just in case yeah yeah, 
Yeah, why not? <laughs> like, if you can take a priest into battle, you can take a poet on the ocean. <laughs> why not? So, some theories have posited that it was, in fact, the blue men of the Minch who killed the lighthouse keepers. Maybe there was no ships about, they were bored. Yeah. So they went up to the island instead. They challenged them to what is essentially a rap battle. That's yeah, what that's, it is. That is, that's true. <laughs> it's a rap battle. And then they killed them when they lost. Hey. Seems legit. And uh, there are reports of subsequent keepers of the lighthouse claiming to hear what sounded like singing on the waves and in the wind for years after the keepers went missing. Ooh, that gave me chills. Although, I will say, that's just like being at sea in bad weather. Yeah. The wind, yeah. the waves, it always sounds like someone singing. Yeah. 99% sure that's what the sirens were. It was just the wind. Nope. Disagree. Uh, but what I was going to say that made me laugh was, it's like, it's like, an aquatic version of Sawney Bean, because all roads lead back to Sawney Bean. <laughs> You've a clan of cannibals living in an underwater cave and a system. Cave. They come out, they attack unsuspecting travellers, and they oh. take them. Shit, you're right. <laughs> oh my god. You know... I don't think the gremlin realised what she was doing when she asked for that story <laughs> like it it will never leave us now no this you know this horrible propaganda myth about the scots you know yeah. originated it's... by the english is now just the underlying theme of everything we do yeah it's just like it's it can be related it's it's no longer the six degrees of separation or kevin bacon it's the six degrees of sonny bean <laughs> Oh, Christ almighty. And that is the story of the lost lighthouse keepers of the Flannan Isles. Thoughts? Oh, boy. <laughs> Definitely blue mermaid evil evil guys with the, with the caves mm. and stuff and, and poetry. Love it. <laughs> I, all I, in. I absolutely love when we find out all these folklore things. Yeah, me too. And I love the connection between like true crime and folklore and the supernatural. I love where it all overlaps. Yeah. Realistically. <laughs> if I don't we, like it when you say things like that. If we must go there, I <sighs> think they were probably swept out to sea. Yeah. But, so yeah. the Flannan Isles are on the 58th North Parallel. There is nothing between them and Canada. They are the first thing to get hit on that line, that line of latitude. Between, yeah. There's nothing between them and Canada. It's just like, just building so, and building and building. Yeah, and in the 1950s, waves were observed reaching over 300 feet before crashing onto the island. Fuck that. So that's, oh, that's taller than the whole lighthouse. Yeah, exactly. Oh, there's a dog at my window. Realistically, I think that's probably what happened. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. Um, like, th There could have been something, you know, like, one of them could have had, like, a complete mental breakdown um, mm -hmm. and killed the others and then took their own life. Anything like that could have happened. But I think... Is it Occam's Razor? The simplest... Uh, explanation yeah. is usually is it, the... Yeah, the simplest explanation is usually the most likely. Yeah. I think they were probably swept off. Um, I, yeah. Mackenzie, dude, just neglectful in his duties. The blue, the blue men should take him. Yeah. He probably couldn't come up with a good poem. No. He's too busy not doing what he was supposed to do. Um, yeah, I like, uh, obviously, I do think that probably they got, they got got by the water, which like, 
is not such a crazy thing when no. you think about the conditions, when you think about like the remoteness of the location, uh, the yeah. the time of year. I think that's the thing that also like I kept forgetting uh, throughout the story is that like it's December, it's late December, it is fucking cold. Yeah. So, like, it's it's not going to take much for you to become completely exposed, like, um, to succumb to the elements. Yeah. No. Absolutely. You know, them being killed or kidnapped is possible, but yeah. if the weather's that bad and the docks are that badly damaged, because it's only the west dock that was damaged, the east dock, which would obviously be more sheltered. Uh huh. I didn't have that kind of damage. Yeah. So it's just the west dock. But if there's that kind of damage, someone else is going to struggle to get up onto the the island anyway. Yeah. And they have the element of the. They have not the element of surprise, like the advantage. They have the high ground. Yeah, literally. Literally. They have the advantage of being able to see. That was part of their job was to watch. Yeah. What was going on. So. Um, It just doesn't seem that likely to me. I think the most likely explanation is definitely the power of the ocean. Yeah. And uh, the. Most satisfying explanation is the blue men. Blue men of the Minch, yeah. Yeah. Obviously. Um, <laughs> yeah, so earlier on today, I watched The Vanishing, which is one of the films that have been made based on this story. So it was a 2018 film. If you're in the UK, it's on all four. Um, so that's like free streaming. Um, it's like one hour forty. It's a bit long for me. I was gonna life. say that's way too. Long. It's a bit long for what it is, <laughs> but it does have Gerard Butler. He uh, as a uh, uh, James Ducat, uh, Peter Mullen as Thomas Marshall, and uh, Connor Swindles as Donald MacArthur. One of these things is not like the other. Two of these are Glaswegian actors, and one of them is from southern England. I mean... I know. Yeah. But, so Con- Connor Swindles, if you don't know, uh, is in Sex Education on Netflix. Yeah. Uh, he plays Adam Groff. And he's also on Vigil, which by the time this episode goes out, it, the final episode will have aired and I will still be recovering from it because it's very, very, I'm very, very invested. I haven't seen it. Oh, we're going to have to talk about that in a minute. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's he's also in that. Uh, but yeah, I was watching, I was like, I'm sure he's not Glaswegian. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that, that story, or that film, is based on, you know, they're the three keepers, they go out, and... A small rowing boat washes up and the person on it, they think he's dead. He isn't. He tries to kill one of the keepers and then they find he has a big chest filled with treasures. And then a whole heap of shit comes after that. They open the (laughs) chest to see what's inside it and it's kind of like they open Pandora's box. Uh, Does nothing go right after that? (laughs) Uh, They should know better, really. Um, It's interesting. It's a bit long, like I say. Yeah. It's okay. But yeah. Um and it was only made three years ago. And I feel like for it being so recent it should have been better. Yeah. I think we can make a better movie about this than that. But you want to make a um, a movie about the blue men, don't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Who I mean wouldn't? I'm all for it. Oh, but can we get the blue man group to play them? Who's financing our film, by the way? (laughs) Nobody. Who's financing it? (laughs) Patreon. Well, there's your answer. No, we cannot get the Blue Man Group. Can we... Okay, here's the thing. I, in fifth grade, was a Blue Man for Halloween. So (laughs) somewhere, I have a mask and blue gardening gloves that I wore for the costume. And like a a black mock turtleneck. (laughs) From like Land's End. So I think if we find that. 
and base the costumes on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll be totally fine. <laughs> this is why we don't record at night. Yeah, I have noticed this happens when we record at night, but you're the one went and got a full-time job. I know. So sorry. But yeah, so if you do want to watch a film very loosely based on this, yeah, go watch yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, final question. Aliens or Yetis? Uh, category C, Blue Men. <laughs> but also Yetis. Always. Is there, is there like a Scottish folklore version of Yetis? I need to find this out because like I, I need to make it my asked, life's mission to... I think we've asked this know. question before. Yeah. Let me just make a note. Yeah, same. Scottish Yetis. Nessie, Nessie the Yeti? Well, yeah, but Yeti, uh, Nessie is very isolated. She True. lives on her own. In a lock. Yeah. Or maybe maybe she's a sacrificial Nessie. And she's the one they sent to the surface and all the others live deep in the Just lock. Stayed down. Oh, I don't know. Poor Nessie. Now I just feel sad. So on that note <laughs> Where the fuck are we? <laughs> I don't know. How did we get here? Um yeah. So, you tell us, was it aliens, or yetis, or blue men of the minch? I think we all know the right answer, but, yeah. you know, it's fine. Uh, and if you like the show, be sure to rate and review us on your podcast app, especially Apple Podcasts, and subscribe so you never miss a new episode. We love it if you rate and review, uh, but sometimes what's even better than that is good old regular word of mouth or word of text. So if you like this episode and think you know someone else who might like it, uh, please share it with them and send them our way. And uh, if you'd like to help us cover the costs of making the podcast and help invest in the future of the show because you want more bullshit like this. Because you want to see this movie. <laughs> That's it. Like, if you want to see this movie with my fifth grade blue man costume, go to Patreon. Join our Patreon page. <laughs> uh, pledges start from just one pound a month. Every patron gets regular episodes a day early, a shout out on the show, priority case requests, and a lifetime discount on merch. And that's just for one pound. As the tiers go up, you get even more, including bonus episodes and exclusive stationery that you can't buy anywhere. So check that out at patreon.com forward slash square mile of murder. Links are in all the usual places. And uh, I'm going to say it right here as a guarantee. If we can use Patreon to fund this film. All all patrons will be able to watch it. <laughs> from from one pound up yeah so yeah. you too can get get in on the ground floor of this high budget feature film <laughs> and by feature i mean it will feature something being filmed and that's about <laughs> it and on that uh thank you for listening we will be back next week I don't even know what we're doing next week. <laughs> Nothing as exciting as this. No. Clearly. Uh, no Clearly. blue men next week. But uh, we will have a, another... I think... Are we moving on to... We are doing spooky stories next week, aren't we? Yeah. I think that's the start of our proper Halloween. I think so, yeah. Stories is next week. So, yeah. Into autumn. Everyone get your pumpkins out. <laughs> that sounds way more suggestive than it was meant to <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I didn't think it did, but then I did that weird laugh, and so I think it made it worse. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. Get your pumpkins out, get your skulls out, get the the Halloween ducks are coming out for the rest yeah. of them for this next month. Uh so we'll be back next week. Uh see you then. Yeah. Bye. Thanks guys. Bye. <laughs>